Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to this meeting of First Southern Baptist Church. I want to read to you this morning from Psalm 90. Psalm 90, starting in verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood, and they fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. And before I pray, let me remind you, the psalms are given to you when you are prayerless. God doesn't hold that against you. He gives you his words. So let's pray together as we open our worship service today. Father, I thank you that you take care of us in so many ways. And God, I know there's so much uh, hurt, even in our region uh, this weekend, that, that God, there's so much going on as we all walk into this room today in our hearts. And you are aware of that even more than any of us are. I pray today that you would bind us together. Let us know that we are cared for. You tell us to cast our cares and our struggles on you because you care for us. I pray, God, we'd be aware of that today. We're yours. Help us to be your people. Help us to know that even when we fail being your people, you don't give up on us. Help us to keep on looking to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Merry Christmas. We are glad to see you here this morning. Uh, we have tons of reasons to celebrate and worship today. Uh, an eternal hope, a joy that is not based on the circumstances of this day, um, a love that is not based on anything we've done that is unconditional and sacrificial, um, and just a good God who loves us, who sent his son and loves us and is with us and promises never to leave or forsake us and that is with us here today. So we are glad that you are here today and that we can worship that God together. Uh, if you are visiting with us this morning, we're especially glad to have you. We pray that you will feel the warmth and love of the fellowship here at First Southern Baptist Church. Uh, we would love to connect with you and your family and see how we might be able to encourage you, how we might be able to pray for you, how we might be able to come alongside whatever walk of life you are in uh, in this faith uh, if you're visiting with us, we want to draw your attention to the seat in front of you where you'll find a connection card that looks just like this. Uh, if you would take the time to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, this is just a resource we use to connect with people. Uh, if you would fill that out after the service, uh, myself and other volunteers will be at the Welcome Center. You can bring that out there and give that to us. Uh, we will be available to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and again, we just want to be an encouragement to you and your family. So if you would do that, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, also, on this card, for anyone and everyone, there's a place for prayer requests. If you're praying about anything at all, we would love to join in praying with you. We want to be faithful to praying for one another. So if you have any requests, please write that down on that card, and you can drop that in the tithes and offerings box out in the foyer as well, and we will join in praying with you. So we're glad you were here this morning. I'm going to ask Pastor Dave if you will come up and lead us in prayer this morning. Amen. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. I am feeling a little under the weather, so I've been kind of keeping some distance from everybody. Uh, don't need to share everything, do we? But I uh, want you to uh, be sure and be in prayer. Uh, Reggie uh, Hare lost his mother this week, and that funeral was yesterday. Be sure and lift him up in prayer also during this time as he has put in his uh, uh, notice to retire from our church, and so you be sure and be in prayer for him. We'll be looking forward to having a reception time uh, for him and celebrating his ministry and work here. Uh, we'll be letting you know about those events and things that are upcoming. Also, uh, pray for Jackson. He is kind of adding some more to his duties as he is filling in for others who are sick and, and, and out and things like that. So you be sure and remember him in prayer in these upcoming weeks. Then I would appreciate your prayer. I always um, 
enjoy uh, the time that our deacons get together and we pray before uh, come out here to preach and we were not able to do that today and so the most needed thing right now is prayer so I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads with me and pray with me in this service Lord we thank you so much that we can come to you for all of our needs but Lord we thank you for even those needs Lord whenever we recognize that we are uh, uh, not the best that we can be uh, in our weakness. We can celebrate and rejoice and recognize, Lord, that when we are weak, you are strong. And so, Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, we look forward to what you want to do in our hearts and our lives in this time of worship. God, I pray that you would uh, be blessed and, and just uh, enrich the music that we sing, that we might truly praise you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, Lord, use the message that it might be that which speaks to our hearts, where we have needs to fill those needs, and Lord, to call us to repentance, and Lord, to move in our hearts the way you wish. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I do uh, want to tell you today that uh, my heart is heavy for a whole other thing, as there's a lot going on right now. Uh, my college, uh, where I went to... Bible College is, uh, was Mayfield, Kentucky, right outside of Mayfield, Kentucky, um, where, as many of you know, they were hit especially hard uh, by that tornado over the weekend. And, and if you haven't seen the footage, I mean, half of that town looks like it is gone. That's a town of about 10,000, which is the same size as my hometown. Um, so there are a lot of hurting people right now. I know there was a, an Amazon factory that uh, collapsed up near Edwardsville, Illinois, which is north of where I'm from. And we know right now that we need a God who is with us when we struggle. And um, seeing yesterday the news reports of um, something like already confirmed 70 people from Kentucky who were lost. There's so many families um, that, as you know, we're not ready for this. And um, you know what? Before we even uh, sing today, if we could go ahead and pray uh, for them. It's uh, when you've been in these places, and, and uh, th that's something that we need to do uh, as we start today. So let's pray together. Father, you are good, and um, we come in today, Lord, and, and uh, as a people, we have struggles and we have challenges, but we know, uh, God, there are people within 100 miles of us that are, are overwhelmed with what they're experiencing today. So God, with everything we have, we just lift them up to you, and I know that there are people there, that, that, that your people are at work. We pray for energy for them, for first responders, for, for people who are there to help right now. Pray that, that we would see we need you and we would rely on you. I pray, God, that it doesn't take situations like this for us here to see that we need you every day. God, we lift up them to you. You are near to the brokenhearted. We got our heart breaks for these families and these communities right now. And so we trust you that you are near. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so another thing I wanted to mention is that next week you will hear uh, the Christmas musical. And that will also be uh, Reggie's last Sunday as the Minister of Music. So that's going to happen next Sunday, okay? Right now we have an opportunity that we can praise God and worship God. We're going to sing some Christmas songs together. So if you would stand with me and let's sing together. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the place And the mountains in reply Echoing their joyous praise Gloria In excelsis Why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What 
but the gladsome tidings be which inspire your heavenly song. sometimes hard to uh, have heartfelt thoughts in a different language, but as you just sang in Latin, glory to God, glory to God, we are not forgotten. We are not forgotten. God remembers his people. Your world is forgetting daily and, and doesn't believe that God remembers us. That is a message that you have, and so this is go tell it on the mountain. That is a message your world is aching to hear. Let's sing it together. Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching for silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled, when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born Down in a lowly manger The humble Christ was born And God sent a salvation That blessed Christmas Lord Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go 
excelling on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing joy to the world the savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and floods rocks Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love all right you can be seated God tells me jokes while I'm praying to him. This morning, I was praying. And I said, God, you know, my thoughts are not real clear and everything, but uh, you just help me say what you want me to say and help me not to repeat myself. And God said, they'll never notice the difference because you do that every Sunday. And so I said, oh, that's good. This is the message that I had planned on preaching next Sunday, but we've had to reverse some things, as you well know. So I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of John and the first chapter. The Gospel of John and the first chapter. If I am out of breath, that's because I got some congestion. Whoever wrote in Gloria Excels Deo, you know, they had big lungs is all I can say. And uh, it's exhausted me this morning in trying to sing. But I want you to think about this passage of Scripture in regards to the time and the season that we are in the midst of. It is the Christmas season. It's a joyous time. It is cause for celebration. It is cause for us to recognize God's goodness. And I want to point that out in this particular message today. Life is a rather strange thing to try to understand. There have been many different kinds of definitions that are used to describe life. We have a biological definition that's placed in many of our textbooks, and there's different categories describing life in people and animals and plants and different things like that. We live in a day and time when there is a great desire to describe the definitions of life and even how it has impressed our laws of our day and time. I do pray and I hope that you are in prayer for the Supreme Court as they are discussing the things in regards to abortion. Our laws today really have no definitions as life, anything other than the definitions that biology gives us, but there are no laws really in regards to the taking of life. We actually have contradictory laws today. There is a man who is serving two life sentences in California. He killed a lady and her unborn baby, and because of that, the law determined that he should be in prison for two life terms. I know that's not, it'll be done, but he is serving a sentence of two life terms for the killing of two separate individuals. But in that very same state, many ladies choose to terminate their pregnancies, and there is no law against that in that particular state. 
The Bible defines life beginning at conception. If you were to look at Psalms chapter 51, you would find David describing himself being knit together at conception. You will read also in the Gospels about John the Baptist who uh, was in Elizabeth's womb. And when Elizabeth was visited by Mary, John the Baptist leaps in her womb describing life that is already there. Now, I wanted to kind of just throw that out a whole lot broader now to think about all kinds of ideas in science fiction today. uh, If you're into some of that, uh, you will begin to hear them describe that computers might get to the place where they are sentient beings and therefore protected by some definition of legal life. We see life all around us. Uh, All of you who uh, try to keep that immaculate lawn looking like a golf course and you get that crabgrass, you say, where did that come from? I look at that same crab crab that grass and say, I don't really care where you came from, I'm still going to mow you down. It doesn't make much difference. We see life everywhere. What seems rather unique and strange, though, in our solar system is we have been able to even send a uh, satellite past Pluto, and we know that as all that we can recognize thus far, there is no other life except that which is on planet Earth. And we are blessed to understand how special that really is. I know that science have tried to attempt life in many different respects, but all we have been able to see is the manipulation of life that is already there. I truly love science, and matter of fact, uh, whenever I'm looking on a website, looking at the local news or the national news, I tend to rush to the science and technology section to see if there's anything new in those particular areas. Scientists throughout history have been those who have been the biggest proponents of creation, the belief and understanding of God and that God has created. They are often touted today as maybe those the opponents of religion, but yet that is a falsehood. If you look at Copernicus who discovered that the sun is the center of our solar system, he was one who was a strong believer in creation and believed in God. He just opposed the religion of the day, and therefore he was often pitted against them. When you think about Galileo, who through his telescope was able to uh, record many of the planets going around that same sun, he was the one who uh, was very bold in his statement that God is the one who created all that was created, that God is the one who did that. And another one, Isaac Newton, born, by the way, on December 25th, Christmas Day, is the one who discovered gravity. He was such a believer in God that he even wrote books about the Bible. Uh, He also invented algebra. For all of you who are facing finals next week, blame it on Isaac Newton if you don't like algebra because he came up with that. But he believed in the second coming of Jesus Christ. He was not a Trinitarian, but he believed in the second coming of Jesus Christ so much so that he even wrote a book uh, describing when Jesus Christ is going to come back. Uh, if I remember the date right, I think he said it was Jesus was coming back in 2066, something like that. You know, it's just just this is the man who believed in God, and and we often tout science and something that is contradictory to. Uh, Christianity, and in it certainly is not. Look with me in this chapter, in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. I want to read verses 3 through 5 where it says this. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now I want you to just go over with me. Go over to verse 14. I just want to remind you of this verse in this particular message today. Verse 14 says this, And the Word, referring to Jesus there, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, 
full of grace and truth. There's some things I want you to recognize when you think about Christmas this year. We go through the motions, we go through many things, sometimes without thinking, and it is appropriate for the believer to stop and say, I want to engage my thoughts in this. I want to think through these understandings. So the first point this morning is this, all that came into being. I'm taking phrases straight from verses 3, 4, and 5 here. But notice this statement here, all that came into being. The Bible divides everything that exists into two separate categories. That which was not created and that which was created. Everything falls in under that, including God himself. Now the Bible makes it very clear that God is not created He did not come into being in any way. That God the Father has always been. He has existed from all of eternity. Now, we as parents love it when our kids come up and ask the very common question, where did God come from? And we say, well, he's always been. He's always been there. He is eternity past, eternity present, eternity future. God has always been. And we can say the exact same thing about Jesus. Jesus is the eternal Son. Some might argue and say that, well, the Father had to perceive the Son to be a Father. No, not if that Father was an eternal Father. And God is eternal Father. And Jesus is eternal Son. Jesus did not come into being. He always was. Now, he did become incarnate. God came in human flesh but he always has been and he is a part of that trinity that we hold dear in our hearts now this verse here verse 3 describes to us that all that was made was made by him so everything that was created was created by jesus christ So if anything was created, if anything exists now that did not exist prior, then it is God who is the one who created that. This is consistent, if you believe in the Trinity, with Genesis 1-1, that in the beginning God created, and here we find in John chapter 1, verse 1, all that was created was created by Jesus Christ. Jesus created life. Man has never been able to create life. We've done a lot of manipulation, obviously. We've cloned sheep. Scientists have, I should say. Scientists have cloned sheep, and that is manipulating things that are already there, are already alive. Uh, We're able, uh, through science, to be able to manipulate stem cells, and that is something that already exists and that's being manipulated. And there are those things of many that are described today as designer babies, creating babies. Well, they don't create babies. As a matter of fact, they just eliminate all the babies that doesn't have the characteristics that they desire, which is a tragedy that we find in our day and our time. The reality is God is the one who created. Jesus Christ is the one who created. We recognize that much of that which is around us is evidence of God who said, I have done this. And he wants us to recognize that Jesus is the one identified here as the one who creates life is absolutely precious. We need to understand that. Human life is the absolute epitome of God's creation. When God created in Genesis 1, he created day 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. He created sun, moon, stars. He created light, dark. He created oceans. He created land. He created the birds of the air, the fishes of the sea, the beasts of the field. And days 1 through 5, he created and said, it is very good. But then on day 6, he created man and woman and said it is very good God created you and I and you are the epitome of God's love one might want to ask preacher explain to us how you know that God loves us and I would answer that because Jesus Christ came to die for us 
But I need you to understand how pivotal that is in our thinking of God's love for us. Jesus Christ did not come to die for the spotted owl. He did not come to die for the snail darter. Jesus Christ did not come to die for the near extinct mouse residing in Kansas. Jesus Christ did not die for the Grand Canyon, the Grand Tetons, or the Rock of Gibraltar. Jesus Christ did not die for your pet poodle, nor your cat, nor your Tweety Bird. Jesus Christ came to die for people. And all that God has created has been corrupted by sin other than God himself and the heaven that is separate from this world. But understand something very significant in regards to that. Jesus Christ came to redeem mankind unto himself. I don't know of any place where God said that our Jesus said, I, I love the mountains, I love the birds, I love the, the cows. I, I don't see that, but God says he loves you. The second thing I want you to see is in verse 3 here because it says, without him, nothing that was made was made. In other words, you exist today because God made you. God made you unique. God made you specifically don't, 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 don't misunderstand because when some individuals say, well, you know, this pregnancy was an accident, you are no accident. God designed you from all of history and past, and he planned for you to be, and he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. Do you understand that if Jesus Christ did not exist, you and I would not be here today because we would not exist because nothing that was created would exist without Jesus Christ. And we find many different kinds of explanations of why everything is as it is in our world today with things called the Big Bang and uh, quantum mechanics and all the different kinds of things that we see described around us in the world. We even have seen where they have built this massive hydrogen collider over in I've learned Switzerland and other countries that it encompasses trying to find what happened just a second after the Big Bang took place. And we find all this technology, and we are impressed by that. And I'm thrilled that they are doing such tests. I just don't want to have to pay for it, you know. But I'm glad when they find and discover something. And uh, that great discovery several years ago, well, many years ago, I should say, by now, that they uh, found some tiny particle that did not exist in our universe, and then it was in our universe, and then supposedly was not in our universe. And they even named it the God particle. I imagine you've heard much of the publicity that surrounded that kind of discovery and those kinds of things. I often think about such things as that with interest and also desiring, trying to understand some of it. I'm not saying that I do, certainly. But I think about what Jesus Christ has done. Jesus has, has created on a massive scale where we would describe Jesus created the universe. Jesus Christ created to a subatomic scale. And we're talking about the very particles and if quantum mechanics is correct, and it seems to be in a lot of ways, then yes, Jesus Christ even knows where that particle is before we could trace it while it was, when we could trace it, and after we could not trace it anymore. Jesus Christ knew where all those things are, were, and will be because he created all that is. Now, that just should kind of broaden our understanding of these little statements that we read here on Christmas time that Jesus Christ created all this and then some people have to quibble whether Jesus Christ was born of a virgin or not. And I say, really? Is that such a hard thing for God to become human flesh after creating the universe? And this is an issue with you? No. Jesus Christ created it all. Without him, nothing was created. The third thing I want you to see is found in verse 4. In him was life. Life. 
I mentioned already the difficulty that some have around the idea of life. But before life ever began, before time ever began, Jesus existed. God told Adam and Eve that if you eat of this tree in that day, you will begin to die. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Colossians tells us that Jesus Christ sustains life. That means you are today because God is sustaining every molecule in your body, which means that your heart beats one more time because Jesus says beat, and you breathe one more time because Jesus says breathe. You know what astounds me even more than that, though? What astounds me is that we live in a day and time where there are those who wish to curse Jesus, who hate Jesus, who want to uh, malign him in any single way that they possibly can. And while those same individuals are cursing Jesus Christ and spewing vehement hatred towards him, Jesus is saying, I'm going to let their heart beat one more time. I'm going to let their breath breathe one more time. And Jesus is sustaining the very life that curses him. There is a love that goes deeper than you and I will ever understand, and it's Jesus Christ who loves us. And that love is greater than all the hatred of this world. The fourth thing I want you to see this morning is found in verse 4, the light of mankind. I was asked one time, if Jesus loves us so much, why does he not just show himself to us? And the knowledgeable Christian would, along with me, quickly respond and say, but he did. He came as a little baby, lived a perfect life, died upon a cross, and came back from the dead. Now, we know that when we read the New Testament and the Old Testament, we find that there were others who came back from the dead. Usually, it was through the work of a prophet in some way. Rather strange when you think about uh, Elijah, you know, someone just threw a body on him and he, even dead, he raised somebody from the dead. I don't know how that works, but God can do whatever he wants to do, I figure. But we think about those kinds of events and we think, wow, that's what Jesus did, right? Oh, no, no, no. Listen, what Jesus did was so far superior to that, it does not even compare whatsoever. What is special, and I love to go back to some of the Greek idioms and, and the Greek understandings that the Gospel of John was written into. And we, we find some rather interesting phrases said about Jesus when he died. Now, Matthew says that Jesus said, it is finished, and then he gave up the ghost. John kind of opens this up a little bit for us. When we say that someone gave up the ghost, we typically mean that they died but it wasn't their choice. They died without having a choice in the matter. They gave up the ghost because there was nothing else they could do. They died. But that doesn't seem to be the same meaning that John relates to Jesus Christ because it actually gives the indication that when Jesus Christ said, it is finished, he gave up his ghost. And that also John describes that Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead. Now, that's a very unique thing that we find described in the Bible. And the Bible describes that this truth, that Jesus Christ came back from the dead, is a light. It is, in verse 4, the light of men which surrounds the importance of the gospel that is applied to our own lives today. Thomas Edison invented the first light bulb, it is said, and he literally gave light to the world. But it is something that we need to understand. There is a greater light in this world today, and it is the understanding, the knowledge, the wisdom that we are sinners separated from a holy, righteous God, and that through Jesus Christ we can have the forgiveness of sin and we can have eternal life. 
The fifth thing I want you to see today is receive him. Look at verse 5 with me. I want to drill down on a single word here and give you some understanding in regards to this verse. The verse says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I want you to think about this word comprehend here. Now, that's the King James phrase. Some of the more modern translations would be, and they didn't receive him. That's what it says over in verse 12 here. But as many as receive him, to the game, they gave he the power to become the sons of God. But this is an understanding in verse 5 that is a little bit beyond that. Now, we understand comprehend, don't we? I mean, think about it. There are some things I comprehend. There are some things I do not comprehend. I, I watch videos and I have studied some books in regards to quantum mechanics. And I will be forthright with you, I do not comprehend that. Now the fact is, it might be that the comprehension of quantum mechanics is just beyond my mental capability and therefore just beyond anything I can do to understand or comprehend that. But it might be that the comprehension of Quantum mechanics is just something I just haven't shown the interest in enough to dig into it enough. I just haven't studied enough. It just hasn't kept my interest enough that I'm going to keep digging until I get it. Now, this is what I want you to think about when it says here, this word comprehend, is the Greek word katalambano. It means to receive into one's life understanding to receive it with a desire to understand. Do you know that Jesus Christ came into a world that is lost and in darkness and said, I am a light that you can comprehend. You can comprehend the gospel. The gospel was written in such a way that Jesus would even put a child in the midst of his learned disciples and say to them, receive the kingdom of God as a little child receives me. The gospel can be understood by a little child. So when the world comes along and says, I just don't understand this Christianity stuff, it's not because it's beyond their capability. It's not because it's some intellectual superiority that has to be attained to be able to have this understanding of the gospel. Instead, folks, there is a huge desire in the world around us to remain ignorant of the gospel. And there are those who are choosing to say, I don't want to believe. I just want to hope that my ignorance will be an excuse before God in some way, and therefore he'll let me pass in some way. Well, that will not fly, not when the gospel has declared a child can understand the gospel and the need of reconciliation to a holy, righteous God because of the sin in our own lives. There is no excuse Comprehend here means a desire to understand, to be able to open one's heart and say, Christ, I need you to change my life. I need you to change my heart. I need to be reconciled to God. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning. It might be that you are here today and you say, you know, I have just sort of excused away not wanting to know and understand the gospel that God has impressed upon your heart the great need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There are those who will be ready to help you at this altar this morning if you want some help in knowing what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Just come and you can kneel here at this altar and while you're there, some will come and pray with you and ask if there's anything that they can do to help you this morning. It might be that God has spoken to your heart about something that I've not alluded to. Maybe God has helped you understand the preciousness of the gospel and that it is impressed upon your heart and mind today to share this truth with somebody else. Listen to what God's Spirit leads right now.